Hello everybody and welcome to something a little Jesus this opening menu. This looks like some kind of 80s music video mashed up with a James Bond intro and a side platter of edgy. Let's rock, baby. Whoa, okay, we get it, man. You study the blade. And that's just the beginning. We've got waifus falling out of the moon, proceeding to burst through the protagonist's office on a motorcycle like it's business as usual. Then she throws it at him, and he's like, no problem, meet Ebony and Ivory. They don't follow the laws of physics, so watch as I stop your bike in midair and propel it back at you. What strength? He was using pistols. Oh, don't mind the sword. Is but a scratch. Welcome to Devil May Cry, an action-adventure hack-and-slash series that centers around our protagonist getting revenge on demons, killing his mother by slaying them by the motherlode. With Devil May Cry 5 releasing next month, what better time to take a plunge into the series and see how its bosses stack up over its 18-year history. Today we're starting with the first game in the series, 2001's Devil May Cry. As you can tell, this game is a little different. <laughs> Not just in style, but in design as well. This game only has five total bosses, but each evolves over the course of the game and is encountered multiple times. They're fought in different locations and progressively get more difficult by increasing their health, damage, and move pool. Often the later locations are in favor of the boss, but you have the advantage of past experience with their earlier iterations to guide you. It's a cool thought, so instead of ranking the five bosses for their 15 different fights, I'm gonna rank each one on their overall quality. Without further ado, here are the Devil May Cry bosses ranked from worst to best. Number 5, Phantom. I should be clear about something from the get-go. I think every boss in this game is solid at worst and great at best, so Phantom bringing up the rear isn't a slight, it's indicative of how fierce the competition is. Now, with a boss named Phantom, you might expect some sort of ghost, reaper, or ghoul. Nope, giant spider. Who'd have thunk? He's an arrogant brat, too. You mean like all your little babies I just smashed for cash in the hallway? Here we go. This is the first boss of the game, and as such, you would think it would be overly simple. If you compare it to the other bosses in the game, sure, it lacks the same depth, but for a starter boss, he's got an impressive moveset. He'll throw swipes if you get too close, shoot big fireballs, leap at you, and summon large fire pillars. What I love about each attack is that, while simple, they require a variety of specific dodge timing. Some require immediate reflexes, while other require patience and adept timing. All of this is centered around his one weak spot. Sadly, we won't be smacking any booties, but it is time Time to backhand a face. Of course, if you want to go in, you're going to have to balance your aggression. He's liable to swipe at you quickly if you go straight in or even block with his front legs, so you have to bait attacks and go in at the perfect time to get the most damage. This rewards your mastery of handling his attacks and moving in on those windows. You can choose to be more aggressive if you're confident in your ability to dodge, but it's high risk, high reward as Phantom does plenty of damage. Another thing that impressed me was the camera. I expected that in such a dated game with a fixed camera, trying to angle yourself would be a huge problem. Not at all in this case, the camera tracks perfectly to ensure you're always angled head on. I found it best to play passively and strike at the right moments, but anything works. Later he'll chase you around, salty about his loss, and eventually he corners you for a little one-on-one -on -one time. Sadly, his second fight doesn't really develop much more than the first. His front legs are flaming and there's some augments to some of its moves, but it's not all that differentiated. Still, it's a lot of fun, a fantastic intro boss, and a great starter for our list. Number 4, Griffin. First a spider and now a bird. At least his bird brain looks like a griffin. At first, this fight seems like an evolution of the big beast fight. Instead of focusing solely on ground combat in a single weak spot, this fight has aerial and ground combat, allowing you to make full use of your arsenal. My initial thought was, hey, look at that big glowing spot on its chest. I bet if I shoot that enough, he'll fall and I can get some hits in. I thought right, or at least it seems so. Initially, I was able to knock him down, but for some reason, I couldn't get it to work consistently. Sometimes he gets stunned with minimal shots and other times I could reduce a third of his health purely with guns and no dice. It doesn't end up mattering too much anyway because Griffin mixes aerial and ground combat all on his own. Just like Phantom, he has four to five moves in his Rolodex that all require different timings and dodge methods to effectively avoid damage. Many of his moves are similar, particularly the ones involving his red beams you have to jump or duck under, so quick twitch reactions are essential. That said, I never had too much of an issue dodging his attacks once I settled down and stopped being so overly aggressive. In theory, I think Griffin is a good advancement on Phantom, but I do have to mention one big flaw. Devil Trigger. Dante's special ability allows him to go into beast mode for a short time. I didn't understand how to do this until I was seven levels into the game, so I didn't use it against Phantom on my first attempt. But woo boy, it makes a world of difference. You can shoot in DT mode, which melts Griffin. Then once you run out, you just shoot some more and it comes back in a matter of seconds. This allows
allows you to throw all melee out the window and make this a trap shoot fest. Seriously, it's like Duck Hunt out here. My second fight with him on the boat lasted such a short time, I couldn't even tell you what his new moves are. The final fight seemed like it was gonna add something different too, but it didn't matter either. Lasers being a little more difficult to dodge didn't stop the hellfire coming out of my gun. Now keep in mind, I always play games on normal. I doubt this strategy will fly on the higher difficulties, but on normal mode, DT makes the difficulty of Griffin trivial. So why is he ranked here? Well, his design itself is still solid, DT mode is just broken as hell. I used it in the second fight with Phantom 2 and tanked all of his hits while melting him with melee. You can trust that this will become a trend on this list. Admittedly, I'd be more inclined to experiment without Devil Trigger if I had unlimited continues, but I can't be bothered to do the entire level again just to get back to the bird. This is all thanks to an item known as Yellow Orbs. If you run out of this consumable, you lose the luxury of checkpoints and you have to do the entire level over to get back to the boss. Granted, levels in Devil May Cry are short, but runbacks are always a tedious thing to me. Once I've gone to the boss, let me fight the boss. It's that simple. Sadly, after all that shooting, I don't even get to land the final blow. The big bad Mundus comes in and obliterates him, and he just laughs like, <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you fail me. What an asshole! That bird put his heart on the field, and that's how you treat him? Or so Dante would say. Hilariously, after fighting Griffin three times while clearly out for blood, he's suddenly concerned for the bird's safety? The dude is saying, give me the power to strike down, and Dante's like, no, you have so much to live for, don't do it! <laughs> He resolves to kill Mundus, and Trish, who, let me remind you, has spoken to Dante for no more than three total minutes at this point, is giving him this stare? Do I even need to say anything? I'm sorry, we're off topic, but forgive me if I continue to embellish on the interactions between Trish and Dante later in the video. Trust me, it'll be worth it. As for Griffin, he's a good boss that is held back by DT Guns being his kryptonite. Tough break, pal, but maybe they'll be balanced in the sequel. <laughs> Number 3, Nilo Angelo. I'd like to take a moment to remind you that Dante offered to show mercy to a bird that attempted murder to him no less than three times. So what is his motivation for fighting his self-image that trots out of a mirror? He watches him transform into a demon and is all, finally, someone with some balls. Fine, if y'all want to stroke swords together, who am I to stop you? The battle itself is very much like fighting a mirror image of yourself. This is a good thing in that you know what type of moves to expect. It's a bad thing in that, as you've been reminded on many occasions, you rock real hard. So by the transitive property, Nilo also rocks real hard. I've always been a fan of fighting doppelgangers when done right, and I think it's executed well here. The first fight has him being rather passive, and it gives you an opportunity to learn how to fight him when his damage is more modest. That luxury is gone in the second and third fights, but sadly again, Devil Trigger mode makes it so you can beat on him without getting hit. In this game, if you hit at the same time, it's effectively a block, so if you have a long DT meter, you can rail down half his health with ease. Then run away, take a couple hits when it's safe, and wail on him again. Or just use an item to restore your meter instantly. It's a shame as it was with Griffin, because particularly in the third fight, he has some really interesting new updates to his move pool. He throws out swords that come at you in different ways that can be fun to anticipate. I still got to experience it some, though, and I enjoyed the fight all the same. It carries a lot of weight, too, because it turns out the guy was actually your brother. That's a pretty big revelation. Nilo has some great mechanics. I love the arenas they chose, particularly chasing him down in the first fight, and I appreciate the twist that adds more emotional weight to the boss battle. It's just a shame that you can trivialize him so much. Number 2, Nightmare. I've been belly aching for the past two entries about how OP Devil Trigger is. The fights with Nightmare manage to balance out in a way that may not necessarily be as directly satisfying as opening a can of whoop ass, but it does add the satisfaction of an endurance fight. Before we get to that, let me address the fact that this guy looks like a green ditto that someone threw a bunch of garbage into. Definitely not winning any beauty contests. Maybe it's because he's so hideous that he's susceptible to light. The main mechanic of this fight is based around you charging up these icons to illuminate the area. This will make Nightmare get hard so you can beat on his blue ball. You may think I'm reaching, but that's exactly what happens. What makes this a challenge is that these icons only stay lit for about 20 seconds. Meanwhile, you have to deal with his many ranged attacks that deal loads of damage, worry about how to best position yourself to whack his tiny weak spot, and deal with the camera troubling this process. This altogether makes Nightmare the hardest boss of the game to me, and it only gets harder as you continue to fight him throughout the game. In the later fights, he gets a few new moves, and the arenas continue to shrink, giving you smaller margins of error. It does at least help you with the camera issue, though. The third fight is by far the hardest with him dealing more damage, having higher health, and being stuffed into an arena the two of you can barely fit in. Just when you think it can't get any harder, this party a two becomes a threesome. Hey Trish, look, we can barely fit the two of us. Three's a crowd. No. Lightning's on the menu? 
Thanks, game. Love you too. The ending has you fighting off Nightmare and Trish's lightning barrage, then Nightmare breaks down into a fully lit solid ball. Just let all your items fly and end it as best as you can. Now, Dante, you naive boy. You've known Trish for what must be only five minutes at this point. Why would you trust her? Why would you save her? Ooh, too late. Punishment fits the, oh man. Dante's monologue is pretty cool by the standards of the game's writing though, so I'll give it to him. You may look like my mother, but you're nowhere close to her. You have no soul. You have the face, but you'll never have her fire! Just fucking... This is seriously the best writing I've ever heard. What makes Nightmare a step above the crowd is that while his mechanics might actually be more frustrating than the previous entries, it helps you stop your abuse of the DT system, which in turn makes this challenge feel a lot more rewarding. It is such a pain to hit that damn ball, but when you do overcome this blob, it's pure bliss. And the number one boss in Devil May Cry, Mundus. After all of our efforts in slaying his four lackeys, we come to the man himself, or the statue himself. He rises up and then suddenly you're in space for reasons that make absolutely no sense, but hey, it's a cool arena, so just shut up and enjoy the ride! The first thing I can praise Mundus for is offering some variety in the endgame. His first phase is a space shooter, and it's surprisingly refreshing. There isn't a whole lot to it, it's busting his balls, building enough DT to charge him, rinse and repeat. But the amount of different attacks he throws at you make it more than enough to keep you guessing. I only faced off against him three times, so while while I could understand how some of the moves worked, things like this red-handed needle attack made no sense to me. I just wiggled around on the screen and hoped for the best. The second phase is much more traditional to the game's combat, and by that I mean you go in DT mode and fire shots until he's dead. Seriously, I did the second phase twice. The first time I tried melee and I died in about two minutes. The second time I kept my DT meter full by using a few items and just fired away. He barely even touched me. I still put this on the game more than the boss design, but it does make an impact. Speaking of impact, what really elevates Mundus aside from the cool space battle in decent second phase is that this is the only fight in the game that has some defined stakes behind it. This guy is trying to bring demons back into power, control the world, and that ain't cool. Demons are responsible for killing Dante's family. Well, then again, if this twist implied what I think it did, Dante is responsible for killing at least part of Dante's family. But Mundus tricked him into it. Yeah. Then there's Trish. Woo! Let's talk about this game of emotional hot potato. Just watch this. You must be the handyman who'll take any dirty job. I only take special jobs. Eventually, I should hit the jackpot sooner or later. But I'm not your enemy. <laughs> you fool! You're so easy. Trish, you? Dante! Dante, why did you save my life? Don't come any closer, you devil! Trish! You! Trish! No! My mother risked her life for me. And now you, too. You have the face, but you'll never have her fire! Don't come any closer, you devil! I should have saved you. People change their opinions of each other on a dime in this game. I'd love to say that you're getting an abridged version, but there's barely any interaction between the two. One minute they want to bang, the next minute they want to bang fists, and then she sacrifices herself after he calls her a demon and says he'll kill her next time. But now he's upset about it. I guess he was playing hard to get? He was throwing a mild tantrum, maybe? Well, his true feelings come out in what has to be one of the best acted lines ever in a video game. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! Just brilliant. That's what I like to call poetic diarrhea. Oh yeah, I forgot. There's a third phase in the final level. Ugh, you have seen better days, my fungus. At first I wondered why you were contained in a statue, but clearly you got a problem containing your goo. Even though this phase is nothing compared to the other two, you still receive a little help from Trish? What the? I mean, people do take a lot of punishment in this game and get up, but still. Okay, so you shoot until you get double trigger and then use it like the win condition you have all game. At least the game is self-aware. It looks like we have a winner. Jackpot. And he's dead. Trish and Dante embrace like the roller coaster Destin divorcees they are. Trish then shows her first bit of vulnerability and human emotion to Dante. Dante's response? Trish, devils never cry. <laughs> this dude just said, look baby, I'm gonna have to shut you up right there. Devils can't cry. Oh wait. Devil may cry. I'm done. They take off into a plane and literally fly off into the sunset. Or day sky. Whatever. Trish is thrilled about it, so who am I to trivialize? In the end, I was thoroughly impressed with the diversity of Mundus' phases, attacks, and the stakes at the end mixed in with some unforgettable dialogue and moments earn him the nod as the best boss in Devil May Cry. 
devil never cry. That's it. Now I'm really done. But for all of you, be sure to share your favorite and least favorite bosses in the comments. And if you want to stay up to date on all my latest content, don't forget to subscribe. I'll be diving deeper in the Devil May Cry series as the month goes on, and I have to say, for all its quirks, the original holds up phenomenally well for 2019. I wonder how the second game holds up. I guess we'll see next time. Until then, thank you all for watching, much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.